Hey everybody, welcome to Charlestown, Rhode Island and the Welcome Burdick Lot. It's probably be a pretty quick little video today. Don't have too much to tell you, so let's get right into it. All right, first off, let me introduce you to the Marys. Buried with her husband here is Mary T. Burdick, Mary E. James Burdick, Mary Cassie Burdick, a plain Mary Burdick whose middle initial I couldn't find and also doesn't seem to have a headstone in this cemetery. So I'm guessing that she is probably marked by one of these couple of unmarked field stones here. And lastly, we have Mary Ann Burdick. Now, as you've probably guessed by now, Mary was a bit of a family name for the Burdicks, right? You can find Mary Burdicks buried in little cemeteries like this one all across Rhode Island, which is pretty cool, right? But unfortunately, it does make my job a little bit harder because whenever I find some, some kind of reference to a Mary Burdick in a newspaper or a book or something, pretty hard to tell if it's one of our Marys or not. So, it's possible that there was a letter waiting at the Westerly Rhode Island Post Office back in 1855 for our Mary E. Burdick. But considering that there was about five or six other Mary E. Burdicks running around Rhode Island in 1855, probably just as likely not. And hey, this news article about how hard it rained on Poppy Day back in 1931 might be mentioning Mary Tripp Burdick as a member of the Poppy Day Committee, but we just can't be sure. And hey, while we're talking about family cemeteries, I think it's a good time for me to tell you a little bit more about Rhode Island's family cemeteries in particular, because I've done a lot of these videos now and I feel like this little tidbit of information is a bit overdue. So if you've been watching my stuff and wondering why Rhode Island has so many of these tiny single family cemeteries, long story short, it's basically because Rhode Island actually used to have extremely loose laws regarding religious freedom and the establishment of cemeteries. So a lot of Rhode Island's more prolific families would just kind of cut out a little section of land they owned and make it into a cemetery. In a lot of other states, you just couldn't do that. So centuries later, we've got hundreds of these along the sides of roads or out in the woods all across the state. Enough that Rhode Island has at least six times as many cemeteries per square mile as the second highest Atlantic state. Pretty crazy, right? All right, we're back at Mary E. Burdick's marker again. This time, because I want to tell you a little bit about her husband, George Franklin Burdick. You see, I was actually able to find a couple things out about this guy. like. Here he is getting paid $15 for helping to build a highway through Charleston. Here he is being mentioned in a Providence newspaper from 1893. Apparently seven or eight men came down from the capital for a fishing trip down here in Southern Rhode Island and they spent the night at George's house. I also found a court record from 1880 dealing with land ownership laws. I skimmed over the case and as best as I can tell, its argument is over who is the rightful heir to a piece of property here in Charlestown. George here gets mentioned about halfway through during the cross-examination of one of the guys trying to claim ownership of the land. Apparently George was living on the parcel and the guy went up and knocked on his door and said, hey, you know what? I own this land and you owe me rent money. Apparently George thought for a moment and then handed the guy two bucks and said, that's all you're gonna get. It is worth mentioning though, that those last couple of stories might be about George's son, who's buried right over here, also named George. Based on the dates though, I'd be inclined to guess uh, that they were talking about the elder George. Oh, and by the way, while we're over here at this George, he actually had a pretty interesting job title that you've probably never heard of, because it's been pretty much retired for quite a long while now. You see, old George here was the town of Charlestown, Rhode Island's overseer of the poor. Before I tell you what that means though, again, it could have been the older George who had this job too. I'm just pretty sure it was this one since the older George would have been well into his 70s for all the news articles I read on this. Anyway, what is an overseer of the poor? Well, to keep it simple, it was basically the government official who was in charge of the local government's portion of tax revenue that was set aside to assist those in need. Now, this position has a pretty crazy history of being used both for good and not so good purposes depending on who the overseer is and where they're working. But the one constant that's pretty crazy to think about in modern times is that the overseer of the poor was no small job. 
It used to be a hugely important role. In a lot of localities, the overseer controlled far and away the biggest slice of the local government's budget. If you were just an average working person, it was pretty likely that your overseer of the poor had a whole lot more influence on your life and mattered a whole lot more to you than who your governor was, for example. And now the title is basically an antiquity, something totally phased out. Most people have probably never even heard of an overseer of the poor. It's crazy how that works, right? And over here we have Abby Ann Burdick, who married a man named John Arnold and took his name. Now Abby Ann actually died a few years before John and was buried here in the Welcome Burdick lot with his name also inscribed on her headstone, waiting for her husband to join her, right? But when John eventually died, he was buried somewhere else, a different cemetery, miles away from here. It's a little bit sad, isn't it? Waiting for your husband, your partner, and you end up all alone. But actually, who am I to ascribe that kind of thing, right? Who am I to make that kind of assumption? Who am I to waltz in here and start telling Abby Ann how she should feel? For all I know, maybe she didn't even like her husband. Maybe she's much happier buried here with her family all on her own. So Abby, I'm sorry for being so presumptuous. I hope you're happy here, really. And last one, we have Charles Burdick, who is actually the first murder victim that I've ever talked about on this show. See, Charles was a former state senator and farmer who at the age of 67 was attacked and killed at his own house during what was more than likely a robbery gone wrong. Charles' body was found on his porch, missing the pretty sizable billfold that he was known to carry around in his coat. The articles I found about the incident do mention, though, that Charles put up quite the fight. The inside of the house was torn up pretty good, and it took six shots from a revolver to finally take him down. Sadly, though, it does seem like the crime was never solved. Three men were at one point questioned about the murder, but eventually released. I really couldn't find anything that provided any resolution of the killing. In fact, it seems like living members of the Burdick family are still kind of investigating the crime themselves to this day. Like I found some little family websites for living members of the Burdick family that were mentioning doing some historical research on their own to see if they can solve the crime decades later, which is pretty cool of them, I think. And one more thing before we sign off. I wasn't gonna mention this because it's a little bit off topic, but I kind of realized the whole point of this show is just to tell you a bunch of random little stories that don't have much to do with anything anyways, so here we go. While I was trying to find info on Charles Burdick's murder, I found out about a whole book series that I just think is kind of funny. Apparently this small publishing company does this thing where they contract small-time local historians to pull together some old crime stories about where they're from. Then they package together the stories into a short little book as a part of their Murder and Mayhem series series has dozens and dozens of little books and they all cover very specific land areas. I mostly just like them because the covers almost always use the exact same formula. Like let's use murder and mayhem in Stark County, Ohio as an example. Three people's picture on top, title, and then kind of a landscape photo. They almost always look like this. Here's murder and mayhem in Southeast Kansas, murder and mayhem in the Finger Lakes, so yeah, I guess it's really not all that interesting. I just thought it was kind of funny how I clicked on one of the first books from those series and then I'm just scrolling through pages and pages of almost the exact same look and cover, just all about different hyper-specific locales, right? But anyway, Charles, I'm sorry I don't have more to say about your murder. I was really only able to find a couple things here and there, mostly just news articles. But I promise you, if I ever find myself a copy of Murder and Mayhem in Washington County, Rhode Island. I'll be looking through that thing for information. I might be back one day. See you guys next time.